Okay, I'm uh, Frank Morgan. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, CRISP analysis toolkit, which is a set of uh, IDL NV software for uh, CRISM data analysis. Um, Frank Singles has also contributed to some of the development of uh, this software, and uh, the Scott Archie has made important recommendations along the way as well, and all the CRISM team has uh, contributed to the great of the course. So, um, CAT is a set of tools to open and display prism data, apply some standard corrections to the data, and create summary parameters, and add the spectrum views, and all the basic uh, analysis stuff that uh, we want to do for the data. Um, the uh, programming for CAT was initiated by Shannon Helke and others at Brown. Uh, several years ago, I took over long about five years ago. Um, it's all runs uh, under uh, an NV, and um, I'm going to talk here today about basic cat mechanics and a little bit of details about the uh, atmospheric correction. Um, the data products that Frank was describing, the MTRDRs, incorporate most of the things that CAT does and more. So uh, I expect that uh, as those products start to come out, um, CAT, the people who are, most of the science is going to shift from CAT analysis to looking at, just looking at those products. But CAT will still be important for um, sort of double checking and making sure that the filtering on that, um, on, the, on the new products is not introducing. Um, artifacts, or, you know, if you see some feature that you want to make sure, double sure that it's a real thing, you might want to go back to your real data and uh, run your own analysis to uh, double check that it's not an artifact. And uh, you can apply additional noise filtering, you can test the algorithms, and things like that. So I think it will still be important. Uh, you can download CAT at this link, and uh, there, there are uh, installation instructions and a video file at that location that will uh, give you the instructions how to install it and find it. Um, there, there's like 48 slides in this package, and most of them I'm just going to leave there as a reference and not really talk to here. This is one of them that just tells where the cat distribution of various uh, files of interest are. Um, this is another one that basically tells uh, how to set up the uh, configuration files. There's a NP configuration file, and a cat specific config file. That you can uh, set up some pointers to one cat, and those, those are described in the uh, set of instructions. So, when you start a cat, um, you have your NV menu, and uh, cat adds a menu of its own to the NV menu. Um, this is uh, the NV5. This is, this is not going to work the same way in NV5 as I can get to know. Um, but uh, it only runs, CAT right now only runs in classic version of It runs in the 4.x versions, fine, and it runs in NV5 classic. But um, I don't have the uh, interface set up right for NV5, uh, the direction of the Excel system that we me right now. But that, that would be coming sometimes it can probably become a tool can for a new file. So the first thing you do with CAT is an uh, open prison file. You can drop that on the menu, uh, the CAT menu there, open prison file, hit that, it'll give you a dialog box, there's select file, and then it will open the PDS um, files or uh, other CAT files that you've already generated. Um, there's, there's a a bunch of slides like this uh, covering step by step things you can do. I'm not going to talk to them all. I'm just talk to the first couple of them. Um, converting PDS to CAT, basically, uh, uh, Prism comes off the uh, PDS files, PDS files, basically, the binary image file with the PDS label. Um, CAT opens that and uh, 
procedural on this is right at an header file and people use that in their own um, One of the things it does is it writes uh, some uh, cat custom keywords in the file so that it can track what you've done with it so far with cat. And a few other things to that I have um, that. Here, the, the uh, conversion from Rays to IOREF. Um, the truth of data file names some PDS or something like that. The uh, TR3 is the, uh, the version for the calibration. 3 is the most of the data calibration. RA there means uh, it's rating standard. Um, I, which is IF, that is a slightly more processed data that's uh, divided off so it wants to generate um, the IRF and, uh, and also some filtering. TR3 is also uh, has some noise for being applied. So if you want to see what the data looked like before the, the noise filtering was applied, you can go to the uh, radius data, plug that into the cat, and then apply the uh, radius to IRF conversion. And all it does is apply by the solar flux without a problem with the noise from the company. So that is like a big um, conclusion. Okay, now the photometric and atmospheric corrections. Um, you can, um, and the next thing you can do is uh, apply photometric corrections. This is just a cosine eye correction. Some atmospheric correction. These are the dialog boxes that you go through to do that, and um, I will uh, describe what's going on here and other the next few slides. I'll also cover some of the details of the resolution and its presentation. Okay, the photometric correction is just a cosine eye, cosine of the incidence angle, uh, division to correct the sort of zero over photometric dependence. Uh, Frank discussed that already in his presentation. Um, the next thing is to, in the uh, IR data, is to take out the uh, atmospheric absorption features. And for that, we use uh, the Volcanoes team, the technique that was developed by the Omega team um, uh, for, for doing atmospheric correction. Um, so that's the, the, the spectrum that's so in the IR over F data before the atmospheric corrections. So you see the uh, very large micron CO2 absorption, a couple other CO2 absorptions here, 1.4 more instances. So here's the uh, idea of the volcano scan here. Uh, the concept is you can fly over Olympus Mons, which is a uh, the, the base here is near zero kilometers of elevation, and the summit's about 21 kilometers. Um, stare at Nader as you fly over and take data the whole way. Then take spectrum from the base where the uh, scattered light has gone through uh, the entire atmosphere. Um, divide it by the summit where the, where the light's come about, over the very little atmosphere. Um, that gives you an estimate of the transmission spectrum for the atmosphere. Because uh, the first approximation, the, uh, the, the whole area is very dusty, and neurologically, the, uh, there's no significant neurological features uh, in the data because of that. In general, we've added over some, some spectra there, which goes away. And um, so, you essentially get an atmospheric spectrum rather than a bit. Then you uh, can scale that transmission to match the uh, IRF and the observation one correct and uh, provide that out in order to take that out for the first approximation. Now, I'm going to talk about this in the next slide. I'll show you a picture of what's going on here. Um, so this is the uh, this is the uh, CO2 region and the two micron region in uh, the IRF before any correction is applied in uh, C202. That's one of the operations that Frank was talking about. Um, when you apply the first round of volcano state correction, you get something like this. 
Um, it should be this, this, this spectrum that I took from a spectral land region in that image. It should be fairly smooth across there because of the number of things that should be going on in the logical way. Um, but in fact, it is full. The reason for that is that the um, spectrum at the some of the spectrum at the base are shaped with what we call temperature dependence to the pressure rock and everything like that. So, um, in order to develop an empirical artifact fraction where I apply the volcano state direction to the cell, essentially, and figure that the uh, result of that should be flat, and um, but it's not. And uh, so, I take the difference between the flat line and what I actually get. And say that's the archive for that volcano scan. And when I use that volcano scan to correct an image, um, I add that back in for the scaling factor that's determined to minimize the correlation to the ship of that artifact. And when I apply that, I get something like that. Uh, apply that additional artifact correction, I get that. And there's, an, there's a second type of artifact that comes from the spectral ship. There's about a 10 foot pixel temperature dependent ship in crystal data. And uh, when you use a volcano scan that doesn't match the um, the ship in the observation well, because of the steep gradients in the spectrum there, you get these spiking type artifacts that need to be really efficient. And um, that is, the fix for that is picking the correct volcano scan. That's what's going on here. Um, we have to process 12 volcano scans, uh, 16 volcano scans, four of them are contaminated with ice and are not using any automated, automatic selections. But there are automatic selection algorithms to pick the best volcano scan. And there's, um, so what you pick the best volcano scan that will generally minimize this type of artifact. And um, that's the same slide that shows the contamination in some of the old volcano scans. Um, these are the current selection methods for the volcano scans. And um, there will be, in the next cat release, I'll have an update to the volcano scan correction that will allow the select volcano scan that I actually want for all volcano scans for all the observations and just about over the course we can find the analysis of the shift artifacts the best. And that would be uh, you know, the I guess um, the rest of the stuff is just uh, sort of there for reference on how we get there.